Okay, I think we can start. Um, yeah, welcome to today's talk in our Learning in Spiky Neural Networks seminar session. Um, I'm Jan Marker, your host, and today's talk will be by Julia Tolinaro, who you also see up uh, on, on the Zoom. Um, the talk will be on homeostatic control of synaptic rewiring in recurrent networks. Um, before we, before we uh, begin the talk, I quickly want to introduce Julia. Um, right, she's, uh, she has been a PhD student with Stefan Rotter in the Brandstein Center in Freiburg before moving on to do her postdoc in the Clopath lab uh, in the Imperial College in London. And uh, she is a co-winner. I remember there were two winners of this prize. It's a newly established award uh, called the Bernstein Cortec Award in uh, 2020. The talk is um, based on a preprint that she has published together with uh, Stefan Rotter. And oh, well, I did not practice to pronounce uh, her name. Maybe you, you can help me later. Um, right, you see the address of the talk on BioArchive uh, down here, and you can um, uh, check the uh, paper out there. Okay, um, Julia, I would hand over to you. We would um, probably answer questions in a question and answer session at the end of the Okay, I will then uh, that's why sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Can you see my slides? Yeah, looks good. Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Jan, for the nice introduction. And also I would like to thank you and Tristan for the invitation. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, work on homeostatic control of synaptic rewiring in recurrent networks and the formation of cell assembly. So this was work I did during my PhD together with Stefan, who was my supervisor, and Neboja Gasparovic. And I'll also present some work that I did with Han Lu. So both Neboja and Han were also PhD students at Stefan's lab. So I'll start about uh, talking a bit about structural plasticity. So, uh, and what do I mean by it? So normally when we talk about synaptic or functional plasticity, we are talking about strengthening and weakening of synaptic weights that already exist. So there is already a connection between two neurons and it can get stronger or weaker. And when I talk about structural plasticity here, what I mean is the creation of new synaptic contexts that didn't exist before, new synapses, or a deletion of contexts that existed. And this can happen between the same pair of neurons or different pairs of neurons. And this is based on experiments uh, showing essentially turnover of spines and boutons. So here I have one example of a study in the hippocampus. And what we're seeing here are images of a dendritic uh, segment. And this is the same dendritic segment over different days. And the structures we see here on the bottom of the spines. And the idea is that this blue arrows show to us spines which are constant across the, uh, across all the days. The red arrows indicate spines that disappear from one time frame to the other, and the green ones are the ones that appear from one time frame to the other. And what they have observed here is that the spine density is constant across the days, but the survival fraction, which is the number of spines that survive from one time frame to the other, decreases with time. And this indicates that there is a constant turnover, so a constant creation and a constant deletion of spines. And as I said, this is work from hippocampus, but this has been observed in different cortical areas by now. And the rules, the exact rules governing this growth processes of spines and boutons are not yet completely clear, but there is evidence that it is somehow activity dependent. And with this in mind, uh, Fault and Petzlaff in their review suggested that uh, similar to synaptic or functional plasticity, Structural plasticity, which is activity dependent, could also be divided into two different groups, Hebbian and homeostatic. And the idea would be that Hebbian changes happen whenever the neurons are creating new spines in the moments of high activity and removing spines in the moments of low activity. And homeostatic would be the opposite. So neurons would be removing spines in the moments of high activity and creating new spines in the moment of low activity. However, in 1989, Damas put forward this idea that the compensating algorithm, which was an algorithm he was working with, that according to this definition I just gave, would be a homeostatic rule, 
could actually implement a Hebbian type of learning on the network level. And this is what we then wanted to test initially. So can a structural plasticity rule that is based on homeostasis of firing rate have a net uh, Hebbian effect on the network level? So to test this, we will then draw a network with the structural plasticity model. And then we will stimulate a subgroup of the excitatory neurons and see if we can form an assembly. And that would be what I mean by a Hebbian effect. So for a structural plasticity model, uh, we have used this model that was proposed by Boots and Van Oyen, and it was based on previous models by Van Oyen, but also by this compensating algorithm by Damage that I mentioned before. And it has been recently implemented on Nest, which is the version I've used. So in this model, neurons have a set of pre and post synaptic elements. We can think of those as spines and boutons. And these elements are wired into pairs of one pre and one post synaptic element to form a synapse. And elements can also be deleted. And when that happens, the synapse is deleted and the corresponding element remains available to form a new synapse. And in this rule, the number of elements the neuron has is controlled by its own activity level. And in our case, because we wanted to have a rule that phenomenologically implements homeostasis of firing rate, we chose this uh, linear rule here with a negative slope. So essentially, there is a target rate here, set point, and neurons will create new elements when they're firing below and delete elements when they're firing above a target rate. So let's now look at our network. So we have excitatory and inhibitory neurons. All the connections involving inhibitory neurons are static, and those are created at the beginning of the simulation. And the excitatory to excitatory connections will follow the structural plasticity rule. So we basically set a target rate for every excitatory neuron, and we let them grow their own connections and rewire until they are firing a target. So here is how this growth process looks like. So this uh, growing a random network looks like with this rule. So we start, as I said, with no connectivity within the excitatory neurons. And because of that, the neurons have a low firing rate. So they have an external input baseline and already the inhibitory connections. And because they're firing below target rate, they start creating new elements, which get wired into new synapses. And the synapses are then new excitatory input to these neurons, which leads to an increase in their firing rate. And this happens until they're firing a target rate, at which point uh, there is essentially always rewiring happening, but the mean number of elements and the mean connectivity within excitatory neurons doesn't change anymore. So we consider this network then to be in equilibrium, and we now uh, start our stimulation. So we are basically going to stimulate a subgroup of these neurons comprising 10% of the excitatory neurons and look at what happens to the connectivity. And this is what we did here. So we are stimulating here this 10% uh, of the excitatory neurons. And here we see the connectivity matrix. And we see that before stimulation, there is essentially no structure. So the mean connectivity is homogeneous across all excitatory neurons. But after stimulation, we have this increased connectivity here between the neurons that were stimulated. And this essentially indicates the formation of a cell assembly. So this uh, group of neurons which are highly recurrently connected. And therefore, this shows that this rule, although it's homeostatic for the neuron perspective, it actually has a Hebbian effect on the network level. So I will later go into details on how this, where this Hebbian uh, effect comes from. But for now, I'd like to talk about uh, to talk a bit about time scales, so we can look into this connectivity, how it's changing from uh, the point where it was at baseline level until we have this formation of the assembly. And what happens is that before stimulation, this average connectivity was at 10 percent, which is the average connectivity of the whole network. During stimulation, we see this decrease. I will talk about it later on, but basically because these neurons are firing above target. And afterwards, we have this overshoot. So here in green is the connections within the neurons that were stimulated. And we see that the assembly has been formed. So this matrix that I'm showing here uh, is exactly at this point here. And now if we wait, we'll see that this connectivity, the strong connectivity within the stimulated neurons is going to decrease back to its baseline level. So this is not stable, but it decreases in a much lower time scale than the creation process. So essentially, this assembly is created much faster than the um, 
then the um, then this decay afterwards. Uh, so now we have also looked into a slightly different scenario. So here, instead of just simulating a subgroup of neurons, we will have something like a toy model for a V1 network where we have feature specific uh, connectivity. So the idea now is that neurons have a certain preferred orientation and uh, they will fire preferentially to some of these stimuli. And the way we do this is that we are going to have our excitatory and inhibitory neurons in our network as before. And we are going to modulate the external input to these neurons such that they have a preference uh, stimulus, a preferred stimulus here, like a preferred orientation. So it has been shown before in this work I'm showing and other ones that if you have such a small modulation on the input to the neurons and you have an inhibition dominated recurrent network, Essentially, you get an activity of these excitatory neurons that are uh, very similar to these tuning curves that have been observed in experiments. So we will do that. Each neuron will have its own preferred orientation, and we're going to stimulate the whole network with different orientations and look into what happens to connectivity. So here is how the activity of these neurons look like stimulation. And we can see that they are sorted here according to their preferred orientation. And we see that they fire very high when the stimulus is similar to their preferred ones, and they fire very low when the stimulus is different to their preferred ones. And now we can look at connectivity. And what we see is that essentially before stimulation, we have a, rec a random network. Again, no structure is found here. Uh, the neurons here are sorted according to preferred orientation. And after stimulation, we have this very strong diagonal here. And since these neurons are sorted according to preferred orientation, this indicates that they're more likely to connect to other neurons which, are, uh, which have very similar preferred orientations. So essentially, once again, we have this demonstration of a Hebbian effect. So neurons with similar preferred stimulus or with correlated activity end up being more likely to connect to each other. And once again, if we stop our stimulation protocol and just let this network run with spontaneous activity, we see that the structure that was created will slowly go back to uh, the original baseline condition where we had no structure. And looking at this in terms of time scales, again, we can see that the creation of this structure here in purple happens in a faster time scale than the decay back to the uh, baseline. So, where did this Hebbian properties come from? So, we can look a bit better into how this rule is working and where this comes from. So here, what we are seeing is the expected change in connectivity between a pair of neurons, one and two, according to their own activity. And in blue here, we can see that essentially the expected decrease in connectivity happens whenever one of the neurons is firing above target rate, here set to 8 hertz. The creation of uh, the expected increase in connectivity, on the other hand, happens only when both neurons are firing below their target, or 8 hertz. And this happens because uh, the neurons to create synapses, so the creation of synapses between two neurons depends on the availability of free elements. So a neuron can only create a new synapse to other neuron that also has a free synaptic element available. And these are mostly the neurons which are firing below their target rate as well. So if we look at our stimulation protocol again, now in a bit more details, when we had our network here at equilibrium, we started stimulating this subgroup of neurons in green, which increases their firing rate. And at this point, they start decreasing the number of elements, so deleting elements, which leads to a decrease in connectivity, both from the other neurons that were stimulated here in green, but also from non-stimulated neurons here in gray. So they are deleting unspecifically to the whole network. And because they delete this input, the firing rate now goes back to target rate. At this point, we stop stimulation, and because they have deleted part of their recurrent input, their firing rate drops. And this triggers the creation of elements again. But as I just mentioned, the creation of synapses depends on the availability of other elements in the network. So they will now connect to other neurons, but preferentially they are going to connect to neurons that have a lot of presynaptic elements available, which happen to be the neurons that were also stimulated. So this is why we see this overshoot here in green. So the connectivity between the stimulated neurons is actually now higher than uh, between the stimulated and non-stimulated neurons. And this is our cell assembly. So the question now is, um, what defines this value here? 
So can we create assemblies that are stronger or weaker? Or what is this, what is this final connectivity going to be within the stimulated neurons? And here we have explored this a bit. Uh, so here is just a very similar protocol. We are stimulating a subgroup of the neurons and we see the formation of assembly as I just described before. And what we did was to vary the strength of the stimulation here on the x-axis and the focality of stimulation, uh, which is the percentage of excitatory neurons which are stimulated here on the y-axis. And what we see is that the stronger assemblies, which are encoded here by the scholars, so yellow would be the very strong ones. So we see that stronger assemblies happen essentially for stronger and more focused stimulation. So basically by having different strength of stimulation and different percentage of stimulated neurons, it is possible to create assemblies that have different uh, strengths in terms of uh, within assembly connectivity. So now what we can do is uh, we could also at this point here where the assembly has been formed, just stimulate again. So we can repeat this cycle and stimulate one more time. And if we do this, we will observe that uh, this connectivity within assemblies in blue is increasing with every stimulation cycle as we see here. So basically it's possible to create uh, assemblies at different strengths by doing this repetitive cycles. And what's also interesting here is that we can compare this scenario with one very long stimulation. So if we do this, uh, what we observe is that essentially repetitive cycles tend to lead to stronger uh, assemblies than one very long. So here in white, we have one very long stimulation. And here in colors, different colors, we have different combinations of uh, timing for stimulation and uh, this time in between stimulations. But essentially, uh, the total stimulation time across the repetitive cycles and the very long one is the same. And we see that we still form stronger assemblies when we have this repetitive cycle. Um, so basically, uh, why is this possible? So why are we creating these assemblies at different levels? And what's happening is here is that the increase in connectivity that within assembly that we see here in blue is accompanied by a decrease in connectivity from neurons not stimulated here in gray, such that the total in degree of the neuron is constant. So if we go back now to the figure we're seeing before, we have an increase on the connectivity within stimulated and a decrease uh, from neurons outside the assembly, such that the total in degree is constant, which leads to a firing rate back at target value. So there are many combinations possible of connectivity within and outside assembly, which would lead to the same in degree. And all these pairs uh, basically define a line attractor, which are possible solutions for this uh, connectivity. So one question now is how stable is that? So if we have essentially this assembly that was formed here, uh, is it going to stay at this uh, high connectivity value or is it going to decay? And I have already shown you before that it's going to decay, but now we can look at into why. So uh, first thing we could think of is that this should be stable because the neurons here are firing at their target rate. And if we look at the expected connectivity at target rate, we see that the expected change in connectivity is zero. So they should not rewire, which means that the assembly should be stable. However, this is not the case. And this happens because the neurons are measuring their own firing rate as this calcium trace we have here. And this calcium trace is essentially a low pass filter of the spike trains. So we can look into how the distribution of this calcium trace looks for uh, an example neuron at this point here. And this is what it looks like. So it's centered at target rate, which is here 8 hertz, but it has a certain variance. So now we can look into the rate of creation and deletion of elements according to the distance of this distribution from the target. And in the case where there would be no noise, and what I mean by this is a zero variance here of this calcium distribution. So there would be a delta function here at eight. We would have zero uh, rate of creation and deletion when the uh, distribution is centered at target rate. However, when we include this noise or this variance for the calcium distribution, this shows up here as a positive rate of creation of deletion, even when the neuron is firing at target. And this means that there is a constant rewiring, even though it's firing a target and the plasticity is still on. Uh, 
And what this means is that there will be a slow decay uh, back to baseline. So essentially this structure which was created is going to be slowly uh, deconstructed until the network is random again, unless there is not a new stimulation. But as I mentioned, this happens on a much lower time scale. So what we saw here is that this creation uh, happens when the firing rate of the neurons is changed. So it's either increased or decreased. And that means that the mean of this distribution is changing, which leads to this very fast time scale that leads to fast creation and deletion. So this would be the points where we have here on the, on the purple uh, curve. However, when we are at this point here, which means that the neurons are firing at target rate, the changes depend essentially only on the variance of this distribution. So this is going to happen on a much lower time scale. And that's why the decay is then slower. So as a first summary, I've uh, shown you that cell assemblies can be formed upon stimulation on a network with uh, homeostatic structural plasticity. That stronger assemblies can be formed by stronger and more focused stimulation and by multiple stimulation cycles. And that assemblies decay during spontaneous activity, but on a slow time scale. So the question now is, are there any effects on activity? So we have encoded this assembly. We know the neurons are firing at target rate. Do we see anything on the activity? So to look at this, we are going to uh, look into this network where we create one assembly here in orange. And now we are going to first look at the spontaneous activity. So if we look at the mean firing rate, we won't see any effect. As I said, this rule is leading to rewiring, fast rewiring, whenever the neurons are firing on, on average more uh, above or below target rate. So in spontaneous activity, they are essentially firing at target rate. However, if there is an assembly encoded, we actually see a small effect on correlations of this network, on the, of the activity. And the way we measure this is with this overlap measure. So this is essentially a correlation of a population activity vector with a pattern. So a pattern would be, for example, all the neurons in the assembly being active and all the other ones not. And we can compare now this overlap when we compare the activity of the full network to the assembly pattern in orange here or to a random pattern in purple. And what we see is that both of them are centered at zero. So correlations are small on average. But there is a slightly larger variance when we are comparing it to the pattern and that to the assembly pattern. And that means that the neurons on the assembly are indeed more likely to be active or not active within the same time bins. So there is a very small effect on correlation. But the larger effect we see is actually on evoked activity. So what we do here is we stimulate uh, the neurons which are part of this assembly before the assembly was formed here on the top and after it was formed on the bottom. And what we see already from the raster plot is that when we stimulate uh, after the assembly was formed, we have a much larger response from the assembly neurons than before. And this can be seen uh, even if we look into the whole population activity. So here we're looking at the excitatory rate of all excitatory neurons in the network. And we see that when we stimulate the assembly neurons before the assembly was formed, there is a small increase because we are directly stimulating some of the neurons. But there is a much larger increase when we stimulate after the assembly being, was formed because essentially this uh, stronger recurrency is uh, potentiating the effect of the stimulation. So what's also interesting is that we can look at this in terms of uh, how strong the memory is. So if we think about these assemblies, uh, the connectivity within the assembly as the strength of the memory, uh, we can basically have memories at different strengths by doing this multiple cycles of stimulations, as I said before. And so here we are just stimulating the same group of neurons multiple times and we get an assembly which is more and more uh, strongly connected. And we can now look into the evoked activity of the whole excitatory population when we stimulate the assembly at these different points. And we see that we get a larger and larger response for stronger assemblies. And what we also observe is that um, there is a, also an effect on how much uh, this network can perform something like pattern completion. So here we see that uh, when we stimulate part of the pattern, so part of the assembly, we get a larger and larger response from the non-stimulated neurons, the stronger the memory is. 
So we can now use these ideas to create something like a readout neuron. Uh, so here we have a network where we have two assemblies formed, this one in orange and the one in green. And essentially this readout neuron is receiving uh, input from a randomly selected fraction of the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory neurons. And because of what I just mentioned, we can actually choose these fractions such that this readout neuron will respond with a positive rate whenever the orange or the green assembly are stimulated. So in a familiar stimulus is being shown to the network, but we'll have a zero firing rate when there is spontaneous activity here in white, or when we are stimulating a random group of neurons in purple or in blue. So essentially these neurons will respond with a positive rate if we are stimulating an assembly that has been previously encoded as compared to stimulation of a group of neurons which are not part of an assembly. So now as the second part of the summary, we looked into the effects on activity and we saw that there is a small effect on spontaneous activity and there is a larger effect on evoked activity and that there is a higher evoked response and basically a graded response uh, for stronger assemblies. So now, um, just to finish, so this is, uh, I'm not going to put anything new here. So this is just uh, putting everything together that I talked about before. But we have essentially this, uh, something like a toy model of a classical conditioning task. So we will have our network formed by excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And we will have this unconditioned stimulus, which we model as a group of neurons here in light blue that are connected to this readout yellow neuron here. And we assume that this network has already learned that whenever this unconditioned, this US neurons, so this unconditioned stimuli neurons are active above a certain uh, threshold, there will be a response, a firing rate from the readout. Uh, then we'll select other two groups of neurons. So two conditioned stimulus, one C1 here in red and C2 in green. And the idea is that if we stimulate them directly, we see no response from the readout, only when US is directly stimulated. And then we'll have an encoding period where C1 will be always presented together with US and C2 will be always presented alone. And now we can look into how the activity of the readout looks uh, like during this uh, protocol. And we see that during baseline, as I said, by construction, this readout responds with a high rate when the US is being stimulated, but not when we stimulate C1 and C2 directly. Then during the encoding period, again, we see the response from the readout when we stimulate US together with C1. That's again expected, we are stimulating US directly. But what's interesting is that during a retrieval period afterwards, uh, the readout now responds when we stimulate C1 alone. So what's happening is that um, by stimulating US together with C1, we are essentially creating one big assembly. So here we have a connectivity matrix and we see that US and C1 neurons are part of one big assembly. And as I also mentioned before, uh, this uh, memory performs something like pattern completion. And that means that when we're stimulating C1 alone after this memory has been formed, we also get a response from US neurons, which is above baseline, that is enough to trigger a conditioned response by the readout neuron. Um, here we are just seeing at the, looking at the connectivity traces between these neurons. And what we see is that um, essentially this connectivity after the assembly is formed, as I mentioned before, this connectivity is always decreasing. However, with every stimulation cycle again, so when we stimulate C1 again during retrieval, this is what we're seeing here, we see that there is a small transient where this uh, connectivity trace is stabilized, but then it, uh, it grows again and overshoots. So basically every time the memory is repeated, there is a small increase on the connectivity as compared to before. However, if these memories are not uh, stimulated again, we'll just see this decay back to baseline and essentially the network will become a random network again. So with that, I would like to thank then uh, Stefan, who was my supervisor during the PhD, Nebo Jain Han, with whom I worked with during this uh, PhD and this work as well. Then Sandra and Mikhail from NEST, uh, who gave me support with the structural plasticity model. Then Uwe, Bant and Michael for support with HPC and you for your attention. So 
Yeah, thank you very much. There is also um, clapping, like visual clapping. Okay. <laughs> thank you. That was very was very straightforward to follow. Um, very interesting. So I would like to open the floor to questions. You can either ask them in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and talk. I have a, a question. This is Gustav Marzburg. You have a certain incubation time after having stimulated the uh, an assembly. If during that incubation time you also stimulate another assembly unrelated to the first, then isn't there a lot of crosstalk between the two assemblies? Yes. So essentially, if you would stimulate two of them simultaneously, you would get also stronger connections between them. So you would still get the strong connections within every individual assembly, but you would also get strong connectivity between them. So they would basically be associated if they are stimulated uh, simultaneously or concurrently. However, if they are stimulated outside this, uh, the other uh, point would, could be that after we stop stimulation, when the connectivity is still below and starting to overshoot, if at that moment we stimulate another assembly, then you would uh, not necessarily get them associated. So then it would depend on how fast the stimulation lasts. So essentially what we what would define that, I would just go back here to one of these figures, is that, uh, so if we look at this connectivity trace, so if we start stimulating another assembly here again, it would go down as we saw with this one and then would go up again. If there is um, a period during which they're both going up, so they're both increasing and leading to the overshoot, they would get connected. But if this is done in a way that we stimulate this one and then we stimulate the second one here after this red period, then they would not get associated. Get it. Um, any idea for how long this incubation time, this rise time would be in, uh, in the brain? That's a very good question. And I don't have a very straightforward answer for that. So this would depend on uh, basically parameters that we use here, which are related to this turnover rate. And uh, what I can tell you is that during this decay that we see, our turnover rates are comparable to what has been seen in experiments. So we have uh, matched that to experiments. However, during stimulations, we have an increased time scales and everything happens faster. And then we don't have direct uh, work from experiments to compare that, to know how this activity driven turnover rates change with the level of activity. So we have used values that have been used before in simulations, but I cannot compare those directly to, to experiments. So I would not be able to give you a proper time scale of how this would be on the brain. It, it, it appears that if you um, have just learned one assembly and a brief period after that, during the incubation, you want to learn a totally unrelated one, then there would be interference. So you would have to wait uh, before you start another learning experience. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I don't know if it's related, but I've seen those uh, works where I think if you show two events within six hours, for example, they will get associated. And if you have an event that has, a, that are presented with 24 hours difference, then they don't get associated. And this would be something interesting to look with a rule like this. And it would essentially depend on this time scales. But unfortunately, I don't think right now we have uh, proper parameters for comparing it directly to experiments. Thanks. Um, extending on, on these this discussion, um, if I recall also the, uh, the paper correctly, you, the connections in the network are not depending on distances. So it's equally likely to have a connection from one end to the network as it is between two different two neurons right next to each other. So this um, learning of two different assemblies might be improved even at the same time if these assemblies would be, could be in different parts of the network if the, if the connection probability is also distance dependent, I assume. Yes, so this would also change. So as you said, we don't have the distance dependence kernel. So actually the original rule by Boots does have it, but uh, we don't use it. So for this basic Habian properties, we don't actually need it. And what we thought was interesting is that, I mean, 
uh, so Boots had been had shown already that there is a larger clustering, uh, an increase on clustering coefficients if you have this rule that he had with the distance dependence kernel, which would be also something we see when we have the assemblies. However, when you have this distance dependence, you also naturally expect to have an increase on clustering coefficient and on bidirectional connections. Uh, and therefore, it's hard to separate those two. And then you can more easily, we believe, form these clusters if you already have this distance dependence kernel. And here we wanted to explore without that to really see if homeostatic plasticity alone, which was what Damage suggested, would, would also have this effect. But as you said, it, I mean, in the brain, we know that there is this distance dependent uh, kernel for connections. I mean, depending on brain area, there are areas where this is not there. For example, I think in CA3 in the hippocampus, there is this work from science. I forgot the, the author now, but where they actually looked and they don't see that. But we know that in cortical areas, it has been shown that. And then we would expect that there is I think it would be actually interesting to see because you could have this clustering from the kernels, which are local, and then from very distant regions, which are still somehow connected through axons, you could have also the connection between the clustering according to this homeostatic um, Hebbian effect. Um, yeah, then are there more questions? Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, this you. is Michael. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks, Julia, for this very clear talk. Um, so as far as I understand, uh, all your synapses right now were uh, symmetric. And I wonder what, uh, what would happen if you add also Hebion as, uh, to a fraction alpha buried between 0% and 100%. And how, if as you play around with this percentage, uh, how it would affect the decay time scale because I think interesting effects could happen there. Okay, so by fraction you mean fraction of of the alpha Hebian. of the mm -hmm. Hebian. So the difference between the the positive and the negative part of the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that's again very interesting question. Uh, I have not worked together with the structural plasticity together with functional, but I would expect that overall if we have uh, basically a Hebian rule where we have um, additive Hebbian rule, and essentially you have this uh, bifurcation of the weights, I would expect that by stimulating, so functional plasticity would happen on a faster time scale. So we should expect that there is a, this very strong, strongly recurrency, strong weights formed between the stimulated neurons, which would lead, I mean, what we know is that this leads sometimes to this uh, bistability of firing rates. So you have the essentially the assembly neurons firing at a very high rate. And this would trigger a uh, deletion of synapses from the model that we see. So I think what we would maybe observe, which could be interesting, is that there would be very strong synapses between these neurons which were stimulated, but they would then delete other synapses until they're firing again at target. And I think this would lead to an interesting effect of having something like a normalization, where essentially the total input to the neurons kept constant after the time scales of structural plasticity. But the synapses between the stimulated neurons would be stronger ones. Uh, so that would be the case on this more extreme cases where we have this additive uh, STDP. And then for the DK, uh, I think the DK then would not be affected in that case. Because as I said, the decay here depends essentially on this distribution, right? So on the distribution of the calcium. And maybe it would be affected actually. So it depends on the distribution of the calcium that turn over. But as that happens, the and I guess it depends on whether the synaptic weights from the functional plasticity would also decay or not. Because if the structural plasticity rule would happen and lead to homeostasis of firing rate, essentially we would have the weights from the STDP also decreasing, right? Because the correlation would not be strong enough to self-sustain the assembly. Mm -hmm. So eventually these weights would decay. And then as the, I, I think it would be complicated to, to foresee, but I think there would be an interaction between then the decay of the functional plasticity and the structural. Okay. But Thank essentially, you. Any bistability of firing rates, very high activity would trigger changes with structural plasticity that would then lead to forgetting also in the terms of the 
synaptic plasticity. Since synaptic plasticity relies on self-reactivation through strong weights for the correlation. Mm -hmm. But this decays can actually happen slower, right? So even if you have, uh, if you don't have multiplicative STDP, so this has also been shown, there is this eager 2015 paper together with Berate, I think, where they have an additive rule. And if, essentially, if there is no weight dependency, and these assemblies are formed where you have this by this uh, by model distribution of weights. They show that the decay of these weights from the STDP are very slow because they depend on also coincident spikes that don't happen that often. So, if you don't have this weight dependency on the STDP, the decay could be slower even with synaptic plasticity. And then even if the firing rate is at target and not uh, very high. So, yeah, I don't know if that was the question, yep. Yep. Okay, any more questions? Then um, I would thank you, Julia, again for this very nice talk and the very interesting discussion afterwards. And, yeah, thank um, you again for the invitation. <laughs> very badly. Okay, then um, I'm only left to leave, wish all of you a nice Friday afternoon, evening, and a nice weekend. <laughs> Bye.